Just ahead this week on Money Matters, voices of concern that Asia might be falling into a debt trap. Exactly how bad are the levels and where is the danger? Smartphones are getting smarter, but in Japan, a curious return to the plain and simple mobile phone. And in China, a booming market for startups. We go to the heart of it all to see what's propelling this growth. What stories matter in Asia? We'll look at the changing landscape of business in the region next on Money Matters. Hello everyone, I'm Hans Schadl. Here are some of the top business headlines across Asia this week. The Korean won touched a seven-year high against the Japanese yen last week. The won even surged briefly past the 900 won to 100 yen level, trading at the strongest levels to the yen since 2008. The won's rally against the yen has policymakers worried that Korean exports to Japan will fall as they become more expensive. The cheap yen, meanwhile, has helped Japanese stocks continue rallying. In Tokyo, the Nikkei index closed above 20,000 last week for the first time since April 2000. Analysts say many international buyers are still making entries into Japanese stocks as they diversify their holdings. The rally might not last, though. Just this week, bond rating agency Fitch downgraded Japan because of rising public debt. China is busy trumpeting its so-called Silk Road projects related to its new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Chinese President Xi Jinping launched the bank last week at a conference in Indonesia. He also announced that China will start up a Silk Road fund worth 40 billion U.S. dollars. China's strategy is to boost business opportunities and trading ties with its resource-rich neighbors in Central Asia. Commodities have been continuing their rally on anxiety over the Middle East and a possible global economic slowdown. The price of oil has been rising while gold recovered at $1,200 an ounce after weaker than expected manufacturing data emerged from Europe, China and Japan. Gold, however, has been trading in a flat range and could fall again if the U.S. Federal Reserve raises interest rates this year. And the recent economic stimulus policies from the European Union have sent many of the region's investors into dollar debt from Korea. Investment funds from Europe last week bought 30% of $700 million in five-year notes sold by the Bank of Korea. Three years ago, the same bracket of purchasers had picked up just 17% of a smaller pot of money. In contrast with the negative interest rates across Europe these days, the bonds for Korean debt offer an interest rate of 2%. Time now for our front page segment. We just mentioned the alarm bells sounding about Japan's high debt, and this is a growing problem across the region. Here's a closer look. Asian economies are increasingly falling into a debt trap. The Wall Street Journal recently published an article raising concerns about the ballooning debt in the region that has hit worrisome levels. And although estimates from financial institutes differ, the overwhelming consensus is that debt levels have surged. After growing at breakneck speed for the past years, China's economy hit a 24-year low growth rate last year. On the back of sluggish growth, China's debt-to-GDP ratio rose 244% last year from 144% in 2007. The Wall Street Journal says that debt levels in a number of Asian countries, including China, Malaysia, Thailand and Korea, have soared to levels exceeding those before the Asian financial crisis. The paper says Asian countries were wary about debt following the late 90s crisis, and this gave them room to borrow during the 2008 global financial meltdown. The problem is, they continued to borrow afterwards. The main forces behind borrowing money differ by each country. In the case of China, large state enterprises, real estate developers and local governments saw their debt ratios climb. While in Malaysia and Thailand, individuals in the middle income bracket have been piling up debt for increased spending. Korea's debt levels are also a source of concern. Household debt is seen as one of the most problematic areas rising after the Asian financial crisis. Rising debt levels are becoming a greater cause for concern in Asia, and attention will be on whether this will have larger implications for the global economy. 
And joining us now with more we have on the phone, Professor James Paradise, who teaches economics and business at East Asia International College at Yonsei University. Professor Paradise, a lot of Asian countries are seeing debt piling up at home. Are we sitting ducks here for a second Asian financial crisis? Well, I don't think that we have an Asian financial crisis now. There are some things that are alarming. In uh, Japan, for example, you have a debt-to-GDP ratio of uh, 400%. In Singapore, 382%. In South Korea, uh, 231%. Uh, those numbers come from a report by McKinsey Global Institute, and they cover the real economy. Uh, if you strip out just the, uh, the housing debt, what you find is that uh, the numbers uh, for several countries are quite high. Uh, so there are red flags uh, out there, and I think we need to you know, look at uh, changes in, in debt levels very carefully. But one thing is quite clear, according to the uh, McKinsey Global Institute numbers, uh, between 2007 and 2014, a number uh, of countries in the region have a big increase in debt, and many of them uh, now have high debt-to-GDP ratios. We mentioned in our taped piece, Professor Paradise, uh, some concerns raised in a Wall Street Journal piece that went out last week calling Korea a microcosm of Asia problems when it comes to debt. Do you see this as an accurate warning? When you look at Korea, uh, you find that uh, it has a, a higher debt to income ratio than the United States. When you look at Malaysia and, and Thailand, you find that they also have higher debt to income ratios than the United States. So those three uh, countries uh, do have something in common. China as well, you know, has a lot of loans to the real estate sector. And as we all know, real estate uh, prices have been going down in China over the past year or so. So that raises the possibility that some of the loans will go sour and that will create problems in the Chinese financial sector. Are those problems manageable? I think, you know, probably they are. The Chinese government has a lot of reserves. But remember that you have a new business environment in China where companies are sort of uh, expected to fend for themselves. So the so-called you know, soft budget constraint has been replaced by the hard budget constraint. So uh, companies will have you know, to deal with the non-performing loans as they can. But you know, in a worst case scenario, I do think Chinese government would, uh, would throw in a, a lifeline, you know, as it did uh, during the 1990s when uh, major Chinese banks had a huge amount of non-performing loans. Well, one thing is clear, these high debt levels give us a very different set of circumstances from earlier boom periods in East Asia. That's Professor James Paradise of East Asia International College at Yonsei University. Thank you again, Professor Paradise, for sharing your thoughts with us. What are some of the most successful Korean products dominating the world market right now? Today on In Numbers, we'll be looking at a few graphs that shed light on some of Korea's most popular export items and how they fare against some of the top competitors. Among Korea's exports, the smart TV is undoubtedly a profitable product that stands out. Korean smart TVs hold 43.4% of the global market share. Between Samsung and LG Electronics, Korea has an overwhelming dominance on the smart TV front. On the tail end of Korea is China. Chinese companies like Hisense and Skyworth come in with a combined share of 13.4% of the world smart TV market. But it's not just Korean smart TVs. Korean smartphones have for years had a strong presence on the global market as well. According to figures from the fourth quarter of last year, despite the significant dip in sales posted by Samsung, Korea still accounted for over 20% of the total global smartphone market, followed closely by its biggest rival, the US, which houses Apple. China was behind the two, coming in at third place with companies like Lenovo, Huawei, and Xiaomi bringing in fierce competitions. And last but not least, a look at Korea's grip on the automobile market. Back in 2003, Korea held 5.4% of global market shares, taking the lead ahead of car ex exports by China. Ten years down the line, both Korea and China are growing at surprising rates, their shares of the market continually expanding. But within its domestic market, Korea's leading automaker Hyundai Motor is said to hold the number one position for brand power within the Chinese market. 
At the end of the day, it's arguable that both Korea and China are continually expanding their grasp on the world market for smart TVs, smartphones, and even cars. We'll continue to bring you more information on Korea and the economy of the world in numbers. And until then, this has been Emu Hee. Time now for our Bits and Biz segment, and of course, trends in business evolve rapidly by the day. Now we have some of the most eye-catching stories online with Saw Mizoran. Hello, Mizoran. Hi. So they're the bits in business that you don't want to miss, reflecting greater trends and developments. And first up, the gap between Beijing and Seoul Super Rich is getting wider. According to the latest Bloomberg Billionaires Index, the combined wealth of the five Chinese billionaires in the top 100 increased by 30% this year to 120 billion US dollars. On the other hand, that of Samsung chairman Lee Gon Hee, the only Korean in the top 100, increased by a meagre 3 percent to $14 billion. Chinese billionaires benefited from the soaring Chinese stock market that pushed the Shanghai Composite Index up by 33 percent this year, while Korean tycoons suffered from a market slowdown. Moving on, when you think about the most expensive city to buy a house in, New York City, London and Hong Kong come to mind. Now, in the absolute figures, this might be true, but when compared to average local salaries, Taipei is one of the most unaffordable real estate markets in the world. According to Taiwan's official government data, the city's housing price to income ratio last year was 15, meaning you needed to save at least 15 years worth of your salary to buy a median priced house. Taipei is one of the smallest cities in the Asia Pacific region. Developable land is limited and housing prices steadily increase, while average wages have remained stagnant for more than a decade. Mizurung, that is a big chunk of change to spend on buying a home. It sure is, 15 years worth. But yeah. for those that are wanting to spend a bit less, a new trend in Japan might be of interest. Now, I'm sure you use a smartphone, Hans, as I do. Sure. But a lot of people in Japan are going back to those lower-end, simple feature phones. I went to Japan to find out more. Japan is considered an important market for smartphones, but what's interesting is that there is a recent surge in the number of people turning to the older flip phones. And as you can see here in an electronic store, we can see the many different types of flip phones on offer. Last year, shipments of Japan's feature phones grew for the first time in seven years. While the number of manufactured feature phones shipped out rose by 5.6% on year, Smartphone shipments dropped. The main reason why Japanese people are turning to feature phones? The cheaper fees. The average monthly bill for a smartphone is approximately $54. But for a feature phone, it's roughly a third of that at $18 a month. On the back of this trend, AU, Docomo and other Japanese mobile carriers are rolling out new models for these simpler phones. Oh, that's very interesting. You know, smartphones, of course, come with so many different functions. I would think they're a lot more convenient to use, but then there are the money considerations. I guess the monthly fees are a lot less expensive with flip phones, right? Right, right. So that is the financial benefit, so being cheaper handset with cheaper fees, but many are just satisfied with the simplicity. So a lot of the people that I talked to on the streets of Tokyo, they said that they didn't want or need the fancy functions of all the bells and whistles of a smartphone. They found them too big and too cumbersome anyway. Now, I wonder, Mizorong, is Korea a different story. When I'm on the street, on the subway here, I see almost only smartphones. Smart, that's Hardly right. Hardly any flip phones these days. That's right. So in Korea, the number of smartphone users has been steadily increasing over the last six years and it surpassed the 40 million user mark last year. But that's not to say, you know, that there aren't people who prefer the feature phones. They prefer them for their ease and familiarity in design. And at the end of last year, LG and Samsung, they launched the so-called folder phones. They combine the external design of a feature phone, so there are the flip phone models, but they have the functionality of a smartphone. 
Wrapping up an increasing number of Korean businesses are getting creative with their office layout. For example, at IBM Korea, workers choose their desk for the day through a computer at the entrance, similar to choosing seats at the cinema. Now, if they need to collaborate with a particular colleague, they can assign seats near each other to increase efficiency. It's only been about a month since they introduced the system, and already self-reported work satisfaction has increased by about 40%. Then there are the standing desks. Big names such as POSCO, Dam, Kakao and Samsung have all adopted desks with adjustable heights so that workers can alternate between sitting and standing. Aside from its health benefits, fans say their concentration and efficiency goes up when they think on their feet. I like this 21st century model in the workplace, Mizorang. I guess we'll have to think about creative ways to change things up in the studio as That's well. Right. Maybe to... we can lift this up. <laughs> yeah, good idea. That's Bits and Biz with Sam Mizorang. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Time now for our Asia In-Depth segment, and we're going to focus this week on startups. And of course, startup businesses always carry risk, but they also bring promising opportunities of growth for many young entrepreneurs, especially in China, where the startup market is booming these days. Our own Im yun -hee went to the heart of all this to get a closer look. Hello, yun -hee. Hello, exactly. So an interesting dynamic going on there. So I was able to visit China's uh, version of Silicon Valley known as Jungguanchu. Now, this is located in the northwest of Beijing. And the whole area itself is designed to promote growth in startups uh, with companies, investors, and even startup cafes all situated closely together. Now, it's reported that an average of 49 new startups open up in Jungguanchun each day, so the place has seen and is continuing to see aggressive growth. Now, I recently visited the area to see just what has made this startup boom possible. Let's take a look. China has been firing up the growth of innovative startups in the country. There is no shortage in the number of young entrepreneurs opening up new firms in the startup market. At the heart of all of this is Beijing's Jungquanchun. A vast number of startup firms from all fields have come together, shaking up existing paradigms in the market. Now, often considered the Silicon Valley of China, Jungquanchun is the perfect environment for these budding startups to flourish. Now, with recent information technology as well as handset companies flocking to the area, this tech hub is growing by the year. Computer manufacturer Lenovo, China's largest portal website Baidu, and many of the country's most prominent high-tech firms were born in a corner of this tech hub to later see their success. Uh, uh Roughly 20,000 firms are located in Jungquanchun, with the number of workers at over 1.6 million. Total revenue last year stood at $560 billion, and more than 200 firms are publicly listed. This is a place called Chukku Cafe on Inouye. It's also where investors and prospective business owners can meet and discuss future plans. Since such meetups can lead to immediate opportunities, it's considered a starting point for new enterprises. Many entrepreneurs are part of the post-90s generation. They're characterized as having a knack for the digital world, thanks to the relative wealth their parents accumulated over time. And this is a popular meeting place for the younger members of China's startup community. But this younger generation are the ones pumping fresh new energy into the market, as well as sparking competition between emerging new businesses. Ma Myung Tech, who is part of the post 90s generation, has already launched his own business. He came up with the idea for his information technology firm while at the Chukku Cafe. The company develops smartphone apps and not only has it managed to receive continual funding from its investors, it's also been raking in profits. Uh, 
从零，然后到一万，到十万的团队，然后有一天我们到一百万团队的时候，我再回过头来来看，我觉得成长对我。With new blood constantly pumping into China's startup sector, more entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley have been coming to Chaku Cafe to provide advice and eye new opportunities for growth. Every Friday evening, competitions for potential business projects are held in the presence of investors, and once a month, actual products are unveiled. Here, there are many interesting ideas, and it makes me feel very grounded, because we are doing a heaven's gate investment. 而天使投资的话，必须要接触到早期的创业者，啊，我们要随时关注到他们的动向。我投了一个项目和演员招聘有关的，一年翻了有三十倍吧。Another reason behind this startup boom is the government's policies to promote growth, from simplifying registration procedures for enterprises to providing education for students and even offering tax benefits for young entrepreneurs. The government has been fostering growth. It has also been carrying out support programs for startups and government-driven education courses to encourage more people to start their own businesses. This business is certainly not easy. If it's done well, it's going to be very high. If a company, you think it's just a job to solve its own job, it's become a big business and it's growing and growing. Of course, we can't do this at all. 就靠我们呃方方面面的共同努力。Yunhi, watching this video, I'm really taken by the atmosphere in the offices. We see right. it's flat, it's mm -hmm. open, it's very mm -hmm. horizontal, collaborative, informal. What's it like here? Is this really a different kind of China these days? Right. So I was speaking to some of the、uh, actual members of the community there, and they said that this particular structure is really beneficial in terms of encouraging them to, I guess, have new ideas. It's very beneficial for them to、uh, be able to get their startups going and to continue with that process. So let's talk about the town itself here, Zhongguangcheng.、Mm -hmm. What is so attractive about this place as a startup venue for businesses? Right. So the area. Itself is definitely, like I said, created to promote、uh, growth in terms of the startups. You have a lot of universities nearby where students can learn the basics, but there are also year-round programs available for students as well、uh, to learn about starting their own businesses. Now, the Chinese government has been offering up to 50% of seed money for startups, and they even provide tax cuts if companies are struggling in terms of profits.、Uh, but they also provide collateral so companies can take out loans in terms of continue, continuing to create their startups. Now, Yunhe, you talked about 49 startups a day.、Mm -hmm. That's an amazing statistic, to be sure. But left unspoken here, of course, would be the fact that many businesses fail. We don't know the exact number of、right. businesses that shut down every day, but、mm -hmm. certainly there are some. You know, entrepreneurship does carry risk, and there's the concern about overheating as well. How did you reckon with this issue in the conversations you had with people there? Right. So, like you said, with all businesses comes risk.、Uh, but in this area, in particular,、uh, the Success, the success rate for startups is obviously very low globally, anywhere you go. But Chinese startups are raising record amounts of money as of late for reasons that are maybe more questionable. Now, it's said that the real estate market is looking less promising、uh, these days, and so Chinese investors are leaning more heavily towards startups. And there are also a lot of investment decisions based on brand recognition rather than performance, such as how much revenue the firms are bringing in. So you can see where they are beginning to sort of grow concerns in terms of investing in these sort of bubble there. The idea of a bubble is starting to appear, and of course, Yunhe. Sometimes these companies hit the big time as well. Xiaomi being one good example from the mobile phone industry. You know,、right. their smartphones、mm -hmm. now a household name. So we'll see how this evolves. That's Im Yunhe with Asia in Depth. Thank you very much for your report, Yunhe. You're very welcome. And that will wrap it up for this week on Money Matters. I hope you enjoyed the program. We'll bring you plenty of stories as they continue to unfold in Asia and give you a view of the changing landscape of business in this region. I'm Hans Schottel. Thank you for watching.